Hmm. No, your assignment's not due on Thursday, September 27th. That's not right. Um, the evaporation and infiltration, that assignment is due a week from today. So that's Wednesday, February 18th, 19th. All right. That assignment's available now. Um, after today's class, you'll be able to solve the, uh, the lion's share of the assignment. The infiltration problems are a little bit less uh, time consuming and in depth than the evaporation assignments. And there's a couple of links on the evaporation homework where you're having to go online to download some data. So um, I checked those links last night. I think that they're good but I think it's also important for you to try and obtain that data early on just in case you have any trouble finding what you need for the assignment. So I'd recommend that you get an early start on the evaporation part of the uh, homework. All right, um, just to review what we talked about last time. In class on Monday, um, we talked about how you can estimate how much evaporation is occurring and looking at the the limiting factor of the energy that's available. And so this phrase, latent heat of vaporization, does anybody remember what that is? It's a physical constant, but what does it represent? It's a physical constant that applies to water. And so it's the something, what, what is this physical constant? The units are joules per kilogram. Yeah, so that's the magnitude, but what does it mean? What does it represent? Good. That's right. Yeah, so it's how much energy is required to change something from liquid into a gas. And so, of course, it requires energy to warm up liquid. You know, to change the temperature, that requires energy. But it also requires energy just to go through the phase change, to take water, even if it's at 100 degrees Celsius, liquid water needs some additional energy to get into gaseous water. And so the latent heat of vaporization is the, the quantity, you know, 2.5 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. That's how much energy is required to make that transition. And so on Monday, what we were talking about is ways that we can estimate how the sun is providing that energy. The sun is doing the work. The water needs this work done to get from liquid into gas. And so latent heat of vaporization is just uh, a way of estimating how much is required. There's two types of radiation that we talked about in class on Monday. Does anybody remember the name of the stuff that's emitted from the earth after it's been absorbed? Logan, I think I heard you say it. Long wave and short wave. So it's one of those two. The short wave is reflected off of clouds or... Short wave is the, the incoming is short wave, and some of it's reflected off of clouds. The part that isn't reflective is absorbed by the Earth, and so it, it's the long wave that's emitted by the Earth or objects that have absorbed short wave radiation. So when we do the energy method, what we're estimating is the difference between the incoming short wave and the outgoing long wave radiation. And so we have to have some equation that estimates for us how much energy is left over to do the work required by latent heat of vaporization. And so this last bullet point, what does the energy method estimate in order to predict the evaporation rate? I guess I'll answer that one since we've already been talking about it. The energy method estimates the radiation available to provide the latent heat of vaporization. So the net radiation is the difference between the incoming and the radiation that's emitted. And so um, the incoming radiation we get from instrumentation data, like measurements of actually how bright the sun is. And then the outgoing radiation, the easiest way to estimate that is just by the temperature of the object. So if, if we're interested in how much radiation is being emitted by water, then we'd want to know the temperature of the water to be able to predict what's the outgoing radiation.
All right. So on Monday, we assumed that really the only limiting factor in evaporation is the energy that's being provided. But there is one other important factor that limits how much evaporation can occur, and that's uh, the capacity of the air to absorb moisture. Uh, even if you have unlimited radiation, if the atmosphere is already saturated with water, it can't accept any more liquid into the gaseous form. And so remember that there's a limit on the solubility of water in air. And when you reach that limit, that's when precipitation begins to form because there's the uh, nucleation sites, those dust particles in the atmosphere that water begins to condense onto. And so there's a limit to the amount of water that the air can hold. Now what this figure is showing is let's consider a control volume in the distance that's just immediately above the water surface. And so if here's some liquid water that is going into the vapor phase, the aerodynamic method tries to look at how much fresh dry air is coming in to transport away the moisture that's gone from liquid into gas. And so the aerodynamic method answers the question, how quickly can water be transported away from the water surface? And so um, it's looking at the second of the two main limiting factors, the first being the energy that's available, the second being we have to get that moisture away from the surface. Because right in the vicinity of the surface, just a few millimeters above the water, it's fully saturated. And uh, just in the same way that there's a velocity profile in a river, and you remember the no-slip condition that we've talked about in fluid mechanics, where if the, uh, if the water is going through a channel, then at the bottom, where it's in contact with the soil, the velocity of the water is zero. And the further away you get from the bottom of that river, the faster the velocity is. And so you've already been exposed to the idea of some sort of a gradient that has to do with uh, your distance away from a bottom surface. And the same thing is true here. The air that's just immediately above the water in that first laminar sublayer, it has a lot of moisture in it because it's so close. The air um, is diffusing the moisture upward, but there is a gradient in the concentration of how much moisture is in the air. So um, the aerodynamic method is looking at the things that could improve the capacity of air to get the moisture away from the surface. And so if it's windy outside, that's going to help get that moist air away from the water, uh, the liquid water surface, and bring in dry air that isn't yet saturated. So here's a graph that's showing uh, the wind velocity as a function of elevation. And so it's a fluid, air is a fluid, that's on top of another fluid, liquid water. And so the wind that's blowing over the surface, it has the lowest velocity down here where the, uh, the water surface is stationary. And in this diagram that I was just sketching on the whiteboard, we assumed that that was a river flowing downstream. And so the velocity profile was increasing as we got further away from the stationary surface. In the case of this liquid water, the stationary surface is the water itself. And so if it's a lake and the water's not going anywhere, but the wind above the lake is moving, then this velocity profile is referring to the air, and it's not referring to the water necessarily. It's just the higher up you get, the windier it is. And maybe you've noticed this before if you're you know, in the park laying down, if you're laying in the grass, uh, it's not as windy as if you stand up and now you're further away from the shielding effect of being close to the ground. And so um, the higher you get, the faster the wind velocity is. And the faster the wind velocity is, the greater the rate of vapor transport. So it's providing air that's not yet saturated with moisture. And the other factor that we're going to be keeping track of with the aerodynamic method is temperature differences. And um, if there's a large difference in temperature, then that means that there's going to be a bigger difference between the saturated vapor pressure and the ambient vapor pressure. Um, all that means is, remember, that warm air can ha hold more moisture than cool air. 
And so if you have air that's warm, like down here at the surface, that is able to absorb more moisture. But as you go higher up through the atmosphere, then there's less of a capacity to hold moisture. And so the question is, this air that's coming over the water, what's the wind speed and what's the temperature of the air? And we're interested in both because it tells us how much moisture the, uh, the air can be holding. And uh, of course, it's also important for us to estimate the humidity of the air that's coming over the water. And so if it's a wind from a desert area that's blowing over a lake or over the ocean, then a dry desert wind is going to pick up moisture a lot more quickly than if the direction of the wind is in the opposite, uh, the opposite way. If it's coming from the sea and the wind is coming towards a, a reach of water that's downwind of more water, then already the air is going to be saturated. And so if the humidity is high, it's not going to pick up as much moisture. And so this third factor, uh, specific humidity, is just showing that the further away you get from the water surface generally, the humidity decreases. And this is like the vertical effect of humidity. But you also need to consider looking upwind of this water, you know, like upwind of this control volume. Um, you know, what's there? Um, is, is it just a longer stretch of additional water that's already fully saturated or is it coming from a source that maybe is relatively dry. So in the aerodynamic method we're assuming that the radiation is essentially unlimited. That the only limiting factor is the transport. So this E sub A is going to give us the units of um, distance per time. And so here it, if, if the vapor transfer coefficient is millimeters per day then that's going to give us the evaporation rate in millimeters per day as well. And what factors go into the aerodynamic method is the relative humidity, starting down at the bottom and then working our way towards the top. Uh, the relative humidity is what's used to estimate the ambient vapor pressure. So it's just uh, the air that is absorbing the moisture. How saturated is it already with water? Because the driving force here, the difference, if you have a big difference between the air's vapor pressure and the saturation vapor pressure, then that's going to give you more evaporation. So you know, the bigger the gradient, the more evaporation there's going to be. And so this gradient is just basically how much moisture could the air hold versus how much moisture is it holding. So inside of these parentheses is asking the question, how dry is the air? How dry is the air that's blowing over this control surface? Then the other term, the vapor transfer coefficient, it takes into account the wind speed. That's U2. It's the distance at some elevated point at some height. And in the denominator of the vapor transfer coefficient, you're looking at the elevation that the wind speed was measured relative to a measure of the wave height. So the water surface roughness height um, essentially gets at if the surface is smooth and glassy, there's not going to be as much evaporation as if the wind is blowing over it and it has some white caps and the ripples and the waves. It has a larger specific surface area. Um, and so any kind of churning or waves are going to increase the amount of evaporation. And so you're kind of taking both of those factors into account. How windy is it aloft, the elevation at which that wind speed was estimated, and then the effect of the wind on the waves. And so you know, typical values would be 0.01 to 0.06 centimeters. But there are other factors that can affect the water surface roughness height, like proximity to, uh, to obstacles, or how windy of a day it is, and so on. Um, and then inside of this, this, inside the brackets there was the difference between how much water the air can hold and how much it is holding. The way that we estimate the satur saturation vapor pressure is by looking at the air temperature. Um, now you maybe remember that we had water temperature in the energy method. And the reason why we had water temperature in the energy method is because that's what we used to estimate the outgoing long wave radiation. Here it's the air temperature because the air temperature gives us an idea of how much moisture can be absorbed by the air.
Okay, so now what we're doing with this example, this is the, the same data as before. And in the first example, uh, just to refresh your memory, what we were looking at is um, for the case where we knew the temperature of the air, we knew the temperature of the water, we're looking at the, for a certain amount of radiation. Went through the process and calculated it was 6.54 millimeters per day of evaporation if we ignore for now, in this first example, we ignored uh, transport and just looked at the, ener the difference between the incoming radiation and the outgoing radiation, latent heat of vaporization. So how much evaporation would there be if there's unlimited transport and the limit is just related to the radiation? So from that first part of the example, we got 6.54 millimeters per day. Now what we're going to do in this next example is we're going to say, Let's instead focus on the limit of transporting water away from that first millimeter that's just right above the water surface. So if we know the temperature of the air, the relative humidity, and the wind speed, then um, let's use the aerodynamic method to estimate how many millimeters per day of evaporation there would be at this instant in time. And so the, the process that you're going to go through is starting at the top, calculate each of these factors, and then substitute it into the uh, equation for E sub A, which is the evaporation rate on the aerodynamic method. All right. Um, So the E sub AS should be 3893 pascals, and that's the saturation vapor pressure. So um, what's the typical pressure of the atmosphere? Does anybody know like the standard pressure at sea level in pascals? What is it? Pretty close. Uh, 101325. So 101 kilopascals. In terms of pascals, it's 101,325. So what this is saying is that when you've got maximum moisture in the air, of the 101,000 pascals, 3,900 of those pascals are going to be water vapor. So if the atmosphere is fully saturated with, with water, only 3% of it, only 3% of the atmosphere will be the water molecules. So that's the saturation vapor pressure at this temperature. Now how much vapor do we actually have in the air? If it's 75% humidity, then that means of whatever the air pressure is, 2919 pascals is water. So there's a gradient. The air isn't yet fully saturated with moisture, so it can accept some more water. If 3893 was the saturation vapor pressure, and if we had 100% humidity, we wouldn't have any evaporation. But we do have a gradient. All right, so now B is just telling us, based on the, the, the gradient in vapor pressure, what's going to be the evaporation rate when we look at the wind speed and the ratio of the elevation at which the wind speed was measured and the wave height. So we're characterizing, if we go back to the figure here, we're looking at you know, how big are the waves and what is the slope of this wind gradient. And so um, when we put it all into the equation, what we should have is that the aerodynamic method says that the evaporation rate is 2.18 millimeters per day. So that's a lot less than when we were looking at things just from the perspective of how much energy is available. Because the energy method was saying 6.5 millimeters, was it 6.5, 6.6 in that ballpark? Yeah, 6.6 .6 millimeters per day if we have energy being the limiting factor. But here, what this perspective tells us is that actually because the humidity is so high, because we have 75% humidity, then we're not going to get 
the same amount of evaporation as we thought we were just because it was a bright sunny day. Any questions about these calculations or the theory behind the aerodynamic method? So the question may be how do you reconcile one approach said 2.18 the other said 6.55 uh, there's a way to kind of come up with a weighted average of those two. And in the combined method, um, we're looking at the limits of the energy that's available and the limits of the transport. Uh, either case is rare that you'd have unlimited energy or unlimited vapor transport. In our example that we've been working, there are some limits on both. We don't have unlimited energy and we don't have unlimited transport. And so we don't just pick the lower of the two because remember each one individually is saying that you have unlimited of the other factor. And so this is kind of a weighted average technique. The combined method just says estimate the energy approach, estimate the aerodynamic approach, and then average them using two factors. One is called the psychometric constant and that can be calculated based on a variety of factors but it doesn't change very much. It's 66.8 pascals per degree Celsius and then the other factor that we can use as our averaging constant is the gradient of the saturated vapor pressure curve and so it's looking at the slope of um, how much moisture the air can hold versus how much it is holding. And so you, to do that, you need to have the temperature of the air and then the saturation vapor pressure, E sub AS, that we calculated in the last example. Um, if we just want to be sloppy about it, uh, this Priestley-Taylor estimation says that you can estimate evaporation just by multiplying 1.3 times this and only calculate the energy balance method. You know, just if you don't have the data you need to do the aerodynamic estimation, then you can base your uh, overall evaporation just based on the energy approach. But since we do have all of that data, um, let's only do the combined method. Let's not consider the Priestley-Taylor. Well, I mean, I suppose you could. It's easy enough, but. Um, Let's look at how would we average these two answers together if we have the 6.55 and we uh, was the energy balance and the aerodynamic method said we were going to have 2.18 millimeters per day. Um, so here what we need to do is use the saturation um, vapor pressure that you just had derived and then the temperature alpha Um, that one stays in Celsius and so that's just the, the temperature of the air in Celsius so that's how you calculate delta and for the um, gamma again that factor is 66.8 pascals per degree Celsius Okay, and remember, in the combined method, what it's doing is it's saying we don't have unlimited energy and we don't have unlimited transport. So if we take into account that there's some limits on either, we have to have a weighted average that um, we can calculate how much actual evaporation there is. And so in the energy method, it said with unlimited transport but limited energy at 6.5 millimeters per day, the aerodynamic method says with unlimited energy but limited transport, it's 2.2 millimeters per day. So you calculate the delta factor and that should be 225.8 pascals per degree Celsius. The psychometric constant, 66.8 pascals per degree Celsius. And then when you combine the two together, the weighted average should be that it's 55, excuse me, 5.55 millimeters per day is the evaporation rate. 
So if this is the evaporation rate, how much evaporation would there be in a day? Yeah, this is the peak, so that was a trick question. You may think, oh, there's going to be 5.55 millimeters in a day, but no. This is just the evaporation rate that's happening right now at this instant where we have the radiation that was described, where we have the wind speed that was described. I mean, this is an instantaneous evaporation rate. So if you want to know the evaporation rate for a day, then what you would have to do is you'd have to have maybe, let's say, hourly estimates of the radiation, hourly estimates of what was the wind speed, what was the humidity, and then you'd integrate over the course of a day by uh, maybe multiplying the rate by the duration of each increment that you have the data for. So in the homework, um, in the first problem, I ask you to estimate how much evaporation would there be during one hour with certain conditions. But then in the next problem, where you're looking up historical data, we actually have the radiation intensity over the course of an entire day. And so I ask you, using Excel, set up these uh, calculations and um, estimate the evaporation rate every hour of the day as the radiation changes. Any questions on the combined method? Now, radi excuse me, evaporation doesn't have to be only estimated empirically. It can be directly observed or it can be um, understood with physical measurement and it's often done with these metal pans. And the idea being that for instance, uh, farmers sometimes have to know how much to irrigate their crops. In the western part of the Midwest, like through Colorado, for instance, it's common for farmers to have to irrigate the crops because rainfall alone isn't enough to provide the moisture that they need. And so um, the farmer wants to know how much to irrigate, but it's not always just related to the rainfall deficit that there's been. You know, remember that the other factors that is going to um, promote evaporation would be how windy was it, how much solar radiation was there, and rather than having a, a numerical estimate of all those effects and the evapotranspiration that's occurring over a crop, by just setting out a pan and then observing how much the pan goes down over time, you're actually physically taking into account how sunny it's been, how windy it's been, and so they can use the evaporation that's observed in a pan as a proxy for the evapotranspiration that occurs in crops. And so the pan kind of takes all of the factors into account that we already know um, have an effect on evaporation rate. And so these evaporation pans have been used um, on land. There's even evaporation pans in lakes to estimate, you know, if you have a, an evaporation pan instrumented in a lake, then you can project that and extrapolate to the entire lake surface. You wouldn't be able to measure all of the evaporation over the whole surface, but you could look at what's happening inside of a pan. And of course, it could rain onto the pan, and so you have to know how much added, how much added water there's been during the observation period, but as long as you subtract out any precipitation that occurs, then the evaporation rate, just watching the pan level goes down, would give a farmer an idea of how much additional moisture is maybe needed. Um, so the way that these pan evaporation calculations go is that to project how much evapotranspiration occurs based on a pan observation, you'd need to have an estimate of what was the humidity of the air, how windy there was, and then you would look up a pan coefficient. You'll notice that all of these coefficients are in the neighborhood of about 0.5 going up to 0.85 or so. Uh, what those pan coefficients are is it's saying you're measuring or estimating the evapotranspiration. And so evapotranspiration is the loss of moisture by vegetation. So you're estimating the moisture loss of vegetation with the evaporation in the pan multiplied by a pan coefficient. And so, for instance, if you see that the pan lost one inch of, of water over a week, 
then the farmer doesn't necessarily have to irrigate one inch because plants lose water less than an, uh, an open pan of water would. The, the plants have smaller pores, for example, that the, the plant kind of retains the water. And so water isn't lost as easily from vegetation as it is just from a free surface. Um, the plants retain it. And so these coefficients have been kind of calibrated for a lot of different crops um, to tell you how well the pan correlates to how much evapotranspiration is happening by the, the applicable plant. So you can see that the wind speed is taken into account, the humidity is taken into account, whether the pan is surrounded by other crops or if the pan is surrounded by dry, um, like dry soil, because that's going to have an effect on how moist the air is before the air gets to the pan. And then the distance of the upwind fetch is another factor that's going to have an effect on how moist is the air before it gets to the pan. So just so that you're aware that it's not all about empirical estimation using equations, but there are physical ways to um, calculate the effect of evaporation and evapotranspiration. We'll skip over that calculation example. I haven't given you any pan problems in the homework assignment. But one thing that I'll show you that's kind of interesting before we conclude is that um, different crops have a different response in terms of uh, how well they correlate to the evaporation that's seen with a pan. And so uh, using grass as a reference, you know, if, if the amount of water that's required by a crop relative to grass is 1.0, then what you'd notice is that um, certain crops require more moisture because they have a larger or smaller surface area. So taking just onion as an example, an onion would require more water relative to grass uh, at the more extreme end. Uh, Sugarcane, although it has a really wide range, um, this is the, the pan coefficient being much higher uh, relative to grass just is taking the effect of the, the width of the leaf, um, how how thin the leaf is, all those effects um, kind of draw the conclusion that not all crops are equal, that you know these pan tables can tell you how much evapotranspiration is happening compared to a pan, but then you also need to cor correct by what the crop itself is. And so um, there's going to be more transpiration from different tree types, but, uh, so the, the type of vegetative cover uh, if we're trying to do a moisture balance on a watershed, we have to take into account uh, the tree types. And if it's an agricultural moisture balance, um, the water demands of the crops are going to have an effect as well. All right, so uh, if we just take one last look at the announcements here, the homework assignment is due a week from today. And the first couple of problems have to do with evaporation. And so now that we've seen both the aerodynamic and the energy balance and the combined method, I'd suggest that you get started on homework five. And then when we get together on Monday and also Friday of this week, we're going to discuss infiltration and ways to estimate the uh, rate that water gets down underground. And uh, it's just the, the final abstraction before we start talking in detail about runoff. All right, that's all for today. Hope you have a good one.